All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our virtual speaking of nature series. Um, if you haven't been here before, uh, this is Mueller Field Station's webinar series. We do this every month. Um, each month we have a different topic that a new presenter um, introduces us to. It could be research related. It could be something like nature journaling. We cover, you know, a lot of different bases. So, uh, Mueller Field Station is part of Finger Lakes Community College. Uh, we're located at the south end of Honeyway Lake. And um, joining us tonight is John Van Neel. And before you know, I pass this over to him, I just wanted to give you a couple of updates. So our next Speaking of Nature is scheduled for Thursday, November 18th at 6.30 p.m. And that will be Nature Journaling uh, for Scientific Creative and Personal Discovery. And that's with Angela Cannon Crothers. Um, you can see all of these events on our Facebook page and Instagram, and there's you know links to register. And you know, you could follow us, we'd appreciate it. You can also see other things that are happening here um, you know, year round. So joining us tonight is repeat presenter uh, Dr. John Daniel. And she's here to teach us um, about track and sign basics. Uh, John is the director of Mueller Field Station and he te teaches various wildlife classes at Finger Lakes Community College. Um, he teaches black bear management and wildlife management currently. He is a skilled teacher, or I'm sorry, tracker. I can't read my own handwriting. He is a skilled tracker, birder, and bad jokester. Um, and he is a exceptional educator and storyteller as well. So it's really, you know, it's always good to have you do one of these for the field station. And if you have any questions, you know, throughout this presentation, feel free to use the Q and A or the chat and I'll keep, keep an eye on that. And we'll get to your questions, you know, throughout the presentation and then certainly at the end of the presentation. So, John, I will pass it to you. Hey, thank you very much, Allie. That was a great introduction. I appreciate it. And, uh, and she was being serious. If there's any questions throughout it, it's, I know from past presentations, it's a little hard for me to see the, uh, the chat happening. So Ali is going to alert me if there's questions in there. And sometimes it's easier to answer that question right in the middle, right? So don't feel like you're being uh, being rude or anything by asking. Before I switch over to sharing my screen, I'd like to point out that I believe that you can wear a t-shirt to any event as long as it is relevant. So I purposely wore my Yellowstone shirt today because we're going to be talking about wildlife. It's one of my favorite places in the world to go and look for wildlife. So. I'll share my screen and I'll get this party started here. So I'm assuming everybody can see the, uh, everybody but me apparently can see this first screen. And I thought about what I would call this. I, I really wanted to call it a beginner's guide because that was mostly for me to remind me that I don't have to teach every single thing I know about tracking in one five hour presentation, which is about what how much time we have tonight. Um, uh, if you want to only stay for the first hour, that's okay. That's probably as long as I'm going to stay. And I always introduce myself as doctor uh, and when I do a presentation, but uh, I insist that all my students call me John. So uh, same for you folks as well. And before I flip to this next slide, I want to tell you that every photo that you're going to see tonight is mine unless I'm in it. And if I remember correctly, uh, oops, sorry. This is uh, the only picture of me in the slideshow. I want to talk to you a little bit about my journey as a tracker. I would say that it really started in earnest in 2010, which uh, was when I decided that it was time for me to get serious about being able to explain to people why the photo that they sent me was not a mountain lion track, but it was in fact a domestic dog track. And I needed some credentials behind my my name there to be able to explain to people what what uh, what the difference between maybe a confusing dog track and a mount lion track were so i started taking classes the very first class i took was a mount lion uh, tracking class in montana but i've been to idaho take i took a wolf tracking class there i've taken general tracking classes in other states minnesota uh, uh, new hampshire massachusetts vermont uh, here in New York State and uh, also in South Africa. So I, uh, the first step 
I would say, and you're looking at an author there um, uh, down at the bottom here with hit the tracking book that, that he wrote. And uh, the first step in my tracking experience would be formal training. So I've benefited tremendously by taking classes from experts in the field. The middle photo there is a green sea turtle returning back to the ocean after laying its eggs on the beach on the island of Borneo. And uh, I would say that the second part of my tracking journey is spending time in the field actually observing wildlife, observing track and sign, uh, and uh, what's what trackers often call dirt time. So it's kind of funny, nobody ever pieces it out to the season, right? So in the middle of winter, I'm looking at three feet of snow and I'm still doing dirt time because that's what that's what trackers call, call time out in the field. And then that third photo there, me with my proud uh, little patch and certificate there, is there is an organization that actually certifies trackers and you go and you take a, take a test. It was actually a two day test out in the field, this particular one, um, and uh, I scored uh, a 93 on the test and that got me uh, to a level three tracker uh, at the lowest level of, of this. It, can, it, it just goes up and up from there. I'm nowhere near being an expert in the field at all, but I feel like uh, like I've learned an awful lot in the last 12 years and I've really devoted uh, time and effort to trying to learn uh, track and sign. So sorry. Trying a new advance and it's just not, there we go. <clears throat> I really need to read this to you guys. Uh, it's just a bit long. So let's do this together here. The competent tracker is both scientist and storyteller. You must critically observe, collect good data and avoid rash conclusions, as well as use your imagination to interpret and celebrate the signs you've discovered. That was written by Mark L. Brock in his first edition of his Mammals and Track Sign book, which is often called the Bible for trackers. It's a, it's a thick book. It's a comprehensive look at all of the track and sign that you're likely to find here in North America and just an absolutely fantastic book. Well, the photograph that you see here is uh, coyote tracks in my backyard here in Seneca Falls. And I thought it was such a nice scenic, scenic look here. What really attracts me to uh, the tracking is this combination of using both sides of your brain. The scientist in me is excited about it and the storyteller in me is excited about it as well. And I think that Tracking really draws some very interesting people. So a lot of the folks that I've met that are that are good trackers across this country really look at nature in a way that's different than a lot of other naturalists do. And I think Elbrock really hits it on the head here because you need to be a critical thinker, but then you also need to use your imagination because you're looking at something and you're imagining what the animal was doing at the time when it when it made it. A lot of people just view tracking very one dimensionally and think about, well, I want to be able to identify what the animal is. But once you've mastered that, then it's how was the animal moving? What what caused it to move this way? Was it being chased? Was it chasing something else? So all the other reasons to why you learn tracks, uh, I'll, let me run through a couple of them for you. I would say that learning about tracks and sign in general uh, has really increased my wildlife knowledge. I uh, not only have a better idea of who's out there, but I have a much better idea of where they are out there and what they're doing when, when they're there. I like telling this story. This is my daughter. I think she was in kindergarten at the time, so that would have been uh, back in 2000. <clears throat> and we, we didn't stop going to grizzly bear country just because we had a small child. We just took a few extra precautions when we'd, when we'd go on vacation um, and we really, worked hard to educate Danica, uh, our daughter, on why she needed to, to behave. I'm, I'm not saying she was an ill-behaved child. I'm saying she was a typical only child, right? You sort of used to get in your way. If she wants to lead, I don't care if she wants to walk ahead on the trail sort of thing. But when we were in grizzly bear country, she absolutely couldn't do that. So here she is. She's a pre-reader at this point, but she can look at that scary looking creature on the sign and I can tell her, honey, look at, this is why you have to, you're either on my shoulders or you're holding my hand. You just can't, you can't wander off by yourself when we're out here. 
we were in the visitor center and they had this grizzly bear track there. So I had her put her hand inside of it and really just give her a sense of how big this animal was that we were talking about that we would be excited to see, but at a distance, not, not nice up close and personal. <laughs> <clears throat> and I really am focused on wildlife. So uh, Ali mentioned that I teach some wildlife classes at the college, and that's absolutely true. I've worked there long enough now that the only courses that I teach are the wildlife classes. Uh, and I love seeing wildlife in person. I, I took this picture this summer, and I think this is now my absolute favorite black bear picture that I've ever taken. Um, this was down in North Carolina at a wildlife refuge. And I 100% I would much rather see a wild bear in person, but because I'm a good tracker, I sometimes know that bears are around even when I don't see the bear itself. So I've yet to see a bear at the Mueller Field Station, but many times I've found their tracks. And this was also this summer. Uh, we found some bear tracks right on our channel trail. And you can see I've got a little notebook there next to it uh, for sort of for scale. And if you're having a hard time finding the track, it's just above that yellow notepad. The bear would have been walking to the right. And uh, I know this is a front left track of the bear. We can clearly see four of the five toes. I think the last one might be hidden in the shadow of the notebook there. And then you can sort of see the, the, the ball of the foot there. And then if you're really looking carefully, and if my arrow shows up, you can see the, the little pad at the very back of the foot as, as well there. So again, yes, uh, much rather see an elephant in person, um, but the second best thing to seeing the elephant is being able to document that it, that it had been there. So this picture was taken in 2019. Uh, Morris Sullivan and I, another, another instructor in the conservation department, took a group of students to South Africa, and we did an awful lot of wildlife tracking and trailing when, when we were there. So have a look at those two elephant tracks uh, just to the right side of that ruler in the, in the dirt there. And you can see that the elephant came after the, the vehicle did. And you can tell the difference between the front and the hind track because the front track would have been laid down first and then the hind track would be on top of it. So that bigger, rounder, wider track is the front track of the elephant and that more narrow track uh, on top of it would be the, the hind foot. And that's going to be a, a, something I'm going to show you over and over again. Many of our four-legged mammals here in North America and across the globe have bigger front feet than they do hind feet. And humans often find that uh, backwards because um, uh, probably everyone listening to me right now has bigger back feet than they do front feet, don't you? Aren't your feet bigger than your hands? Well, we're two-legged animals, so that makes perfect sense. But your dog, your cat, uh, the, the deer that live in your neighborhood all have bigger front feet than they do back. And that also makes sense because there's so much more weight on the front. All that head and neck uh, that, that has to be supported. You look at that elephant right there, you can see that the head end uh, appears to be uh, much heavier than the back end there. So having bigger front feet certainly makes sense. And then I would say that not only do I have greater wildlife knowledge, but even my, my general experiences end up being richer. So I feel like when I walk through the woods now compared to 12 years ago before I was as good at identifying track and sign, I, have a, I, I, I feel like I'm reading more into the landscape than I was able to before because I'm able to detect so much more of what's going on. It's like the difference between being a, a good reader and, and being a poor reader, I guess, or reading a good book and reading a, 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 a book that wasn't written very well. And I'll use this as an example here. I love this picture of this plover because I really, uh, as I mentioned, like wildlife, and I love the reflection of that bird in this picture. But what I like so much about this is that little pool of water that that bird's being reflected in is the footprint of an elephant that came down for a drink. So I just, I, there's just always something exciting to see when we're looking at track and sign. And then of course, there's a research component to it. So it's not all just fun and games. Um, sometimes it's hard work. And there's a picture there of our Mueller Field Station. Some of our interns at our Mueller Field Station uh, do work with looking at, at track or sign of wildlife. Uh, we could do it on a very informal basis. 
ourselves, but there are tracking protocols out there, long-term data sets of people doing things. Sue Morse out of Vermont has created this keeping track protocol where you go and run transects after a fresh snowfall and count the tracks and identify the tracks and how many uh, individuals uh, came through an area and use that to help monitor populations, for example. So I thought I'd give you an idea of some of the topics that we were gonna cover tonight. And I realized just as I was previewing this, that as I was juggling around the PowerPoint at the last minute this afternoon, I didn't juggle around the order that these are gonna be in. So anybody out there that it has a photographic memory, uh, I will talk about all of these things, but not in the order that we're looking at them right here. And I do wanna make sure that I leave time at the end for questions. So that was more of a reminder to me to not be so long-winded as, as I go along here. Okay, first let's let's make sure we understand the terminology here. So the, the, the word that's not as exciting as tracks is the word sign. So sign is meant to include all evidence that an animal leaves behind of its presence. So all tracks are sign, but not all sign are tracks. So that spider web on the left or that deer skull on the right, those are wildlife sign because it's something that the animal left behind uh, indicating his presence, but neither of those are, are tracks. And I do enjoy identifying a uh, wildlife sign as well as the tracks. It's sort of a whole different uh, set of, of, of knowledge though, because maybe I could know about black bear tracks, but not know about black bear bites, for example. This is a great picture because it shows you a bite from 2019, that's the darker one uh, in the center of the photo, and then slightly below that, that much fresher looking bite, that was a fresh bite in 2020. So I discovered this tree on my father's property in Wayland, where the bears like to come and mark it, they scratch it, they bite it, they rub on it. And so I put a camera there because I can't be there to look at it. And that lower picture there that you see, or that, excuse me, that lower bite uh, is, the, is the bite that the bear is doing in the photograph in the lower part of the picture here. Good Lord, I screwed that all up. Is everybody with me though? That bear is biting a tree. And then I took a picture of the bite that the bear left behind there. No one's exactly sure why they do the biting uh, or, or the rubbing for, for that matter, but the in the, Old legends, people used to say a bear will reach up as high as it can and bite or scratch. And that shows all the other bears how big they are and the smaller bears know to stay out of their territory. It turns out that that's not really true. And one easy way that you could guess that that isn't true is that bears are good tree climbers. So a bear would simply need to climb a tree a few feet and bite and make all the other bears in the area believe that he's much bigger than he really, really is but the bears will often grab the tree like you see here, bite it, and then rub their fur on it, uh, rub their back, not because they're itchy, but be probably because it leaves a lot of scent behind. And maybe the biting and scratching helps make the, make the surface of the tree rougher. Maybe some of the chemicals from the tree come out and mix with the bear, uh, bear scent and makes it stronger. Yeah, those are some of the theories that folks have. Sign also uh, includes sign of predation. And uh, last year, we had a robin's nest right outside of our back door in, in our big spruce tree. And one day as I was walking to my truck, I noticed at the chipmunk hole along our driveway that one of the robin's eggs was sitting right next to it. So uh, I, I hope that's not too graphic of a photo for you with the, that, that little veination inside the egg there. But a lot of people don't even know that chipmunks are, are predators, they're nest robbers. Not only will they take eggs, but they would, they would eat nestlings as well. And I'm pretty confident that that was the chipmunk that did that. Although it's probably not really easy to see in this photo, the, the markings along the edge where the egg had been opened were very rectangular, just like the incisors on a chipmunk. So I believe the, the scoring on the, on the eggshell or the chatter is what uh, uh, some trackers call it, uh, really indicated that the chipmunk was the predator of that egg. 
And then I, I thought maybe this would be a time if anybody thinks they see anything in this photo wants to describe this. I tried this on a couple of people and it didn't, didn't, <laughs> it didn't go in the direction that I was hoping, but here's a photograph from South Africa and you can see how dry the conditions are. Tell me what you see in this picture. I'm, I'm looking at, at a particular animal sign here and there may be other animal sign or, or something you can see in the picture that I wasn't necessarily uh, necessarily thinking about, but can you make an observation at all from this? Somebody sees scat. Uh, is it, if you're looking at the bottom right, you are correct. There is a pile of uh, plant eater poop or scat down there in the bottom right. Very good. What else? Another vote for scat. Anybody else? Oh, you guys know your scat. <laughs> Somebody said shadow, a shadow of something. Allie, when I use my uh, cursor, does that show up on the screen? Can you see my arrow moving? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So if, if everybody looks at the area in the front and the foreground of the photo here, look how short all the vegetation is. So in the background, all the vegetation is very high. But right here in the foreground, everything is super short. Everybody with me? Thumbs up. Yeah, All somebody good? said browsing. Oh, good. So this, the area in the front had all been grazed and we have evidence that it was the plant eaters were there because we even have their a scat pile from them right there. And under closer examination, we might even be able to tell which species uh, did some of this, this damage here. The next question would be why? Why is this one area grazed heavily and the area in the background not grazed much at all? And I would argue that uh, we, we also might be able to see a little bit of a rise in elevation here. So I took the picture, so it's a little bit easier for me to see, but this, this is actually, all this grazed area is on top of a, a large termite mound. And the termites will, uh, gather their food, bring it back to their, their mound and eat it, and then they defecate underground, providing extra fertilizer. So the vegetation, the grasses that grow here are much richer in nutrients than the grasses in the surrounding area. And the animals are able to detect that and they end up eating the better tasting, the more nutritious grass first, and they ignore the grasses around it. Isn't that amazing? And so like, like part of this is learning the facts, learning what to look for, but don't underestimate the value of just being able to find something, right? Just noting that this one area was heavily grazed and the area around it wasn't. And even if you came to the wrong conclusion as to why that was, at least you were observant enough to even notice that it was there and start asking those questions. I guess that's sort of the key to this whole piece is knowing what you don't know and, and knowing what you could know. I, I was wondering what the reaction to this photo was gonna be because my hope was that everyone's eyes were first attracted to the beautiful butterflies and then eventually discovered what they were standing on. So uh, I posted this on Facebook and somebody suggested that I was trying to, trying to show that butterflies have some very large scat. So now that we've all used that word scat in the last uh, slide, scat is the polite word that begins with S, ends with T when you're talking about defecation. Um, but neither of these butterflies are, are the culprit here. So this was probably raccoon scat, uh, and, but both of them are here trying to get moisture and salts. So uh, they, that, was, that was the butterflies here. I do need to talk about the idea that trackers spend a lot of time looking at poop. And I make my students know the difference between herbivore scat or plant eater scat and meat eater scat. So for example here, these are uh, pellets from a giraffe. I took this picture in Kenya and I teach my students to remember PPP, plant eaters produce pellets. And it doesn't matter how big or how small the pellets are, right? If you have a horse, you know the pellets are maybe more apple size. Uh, and if you had a small animal, if you, anybody has uh, a gerbil as a pet, they, you have small pellets, but still almost all herbivore scat 
is this pellet shape. If we compare that to carnivore scat, carnivore scat is more log-like. And to keep the alliteration going, I teach them CCC. Carnivores create cylinders. And this was elk, uh, elk hair in wolf scat uh, that I photographed in, in Idaho. I spend most of my time tracking mammals because most of our mammals are terrestrial. Uh, they leave lots of sign behind and there's also lots of, of tracks to go with it. But uh, our not mammals also can leave track and sign behind. So I have a picture in the mud there of some turtle tracks and a picture in the snow there of some great blue herons. And I wanna point out the, the heron tracks for a moment. And if you look at the two that are just above my glove there in the photo, you can clearly see that there's a right and a left. Like you might, you might not quite, if I just showed you one of the tracks, you might not be able to tell which is a right and which is a left. But one of the tracks is to the right of the other one. You, you with me? So we can easily tell which was the right leg. And then look at the difference. There's a little slight difference in how the toes are arranged so that now you can see that that, that odd looking fused toe there on the outside um, is, is a right track. And so if I put it on the other side, I must be looking at a left track. So that's one good way to learn some differentiation. When you have a nice clear trail like this and you can easily tell rights and lefts, spend some time examining each foot so that when you do find just a single track or a more messy situation, you might, you might be a little bit more knowledgeable. And I think that would be maybe my first, uh, first big tip to you guys is take full advantage of the, the easy tracks and trails that you find. So many of, of the people that, that I've, I've met when they track, they, they'll see a raccoon track, identify it as a raccoon, and then want to completely move along and try to find something else. But their expert trackers will find a raccoon track and they will spend a long time trying to see what else they can learn from it. And now that they're 100% sure this is a raccoon, how is this raccoon behaving? Uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, bird tracks that I've ever photographed here was this northern flicker in the snow. So I want to tell you that I took these two pictures on completely different days, but it's the same species. So that's a northern flicker. It's one of our woodpeckers that doesn't have woodpecker in his name, and he's eating poison ivy berries. So poison ivy uh, was named by humans because it's poisonous to us. I think uh, flickers might have just named it winter berries because that's when they eat them. And uh, you can notice maybe the difference in how this track is here. So if you look at the one that's closest to the ruler, you can probably see that there's two toes pointing forward and two toes pointing backwards. And the, the flicker has the ability, like all woodpeckers, to rotate one of its toes so that it's in the more normal bird position with three toes forward and one back, or the typical woodpecker position with two toes in each direction. And that helps them to grab onto the tree when they're, when they're hammering away, trying to get at the insects inside. I guess these are still tracks, but besides just the footprints, uh, the entire body left a print in the snow. These are frog tracks. A couple winters ago at the Mueller Field Station, I saw these tracks cross our channel trail from a little pond uh, body of water into the into the Honeyoy Inlet. And it was just amazing to me. It was warm enough that there was some melting going on and the sun was shining. But as you can see, it was cold enough that there was still a lot of snow on the, on the ground. It was fascinating to be able to document this frog behavior. And I've never myself seen a frog out in the snow, but because of this experience, I know it does happen. Okay, I kind of think of that as all of the introduction. Are you guys ready to really dive into this tracking stuff? So let's let's say that you uh, your goal for coming to this uh, presentation was that you'd really like to learn some tracks yourself. Let me help get you ready for spending some dirt time out there, uh, some mud time before it's snow time. We've got a little little bit of time left here. All right. I'd like to run through a little bit of tracking etiquette, if I may, with you. 
because the last thing I want to do is unleash you all out there with some bad habits. So this is the don't step on a crack, break your mother's back that we all learned when we were children walking on the sidewalk. You really shouldn't step on tracks. If you're in a group, somebody else is going to want to look at that. Uh, but even when we're finished, all of those tracking classes that I told you that I've taken, all of those authors that I've spent time with, all of these experts in the field, they really treat these tracks as something, something special, I guess. And one of them described it to me in a way that they felt that they learned so much from tracks. It's made their time in, in, in the field so valuable and, and rich that they are reluctant to even destroy something that they know is just going to melt the first time it gets it gets warm or or disappear the next time it, it rains but it's almost a show of respect and uh, uh for the for the natural world and even walking very close to the tracks and the trail really disturbs the whole scene enough that it makes it harder to see so if it's let's say it's even just you and a friend that are out if you give some space there, and if I back up a couple here, can you see uh, this is my wife, Laura, looking at a track here that's circled and there's a line drawn in front of her and a line on the other side. And we've been instructed to stay out of that area. So the idea here is not just the actual track itself, but the, but, but the trail, the, the surroundings of it. Make sure that when you're looking at it, you can have an un unobstructed view. And then I stole this uh, from the medical community, modified it a little bit. In medicine, they often say, see one, do one, teach one, um, which seems like an awfully low bar. But I tell my students with, for tracking, they should, uh, they should see one. I'm gonna show you a gray squirrel track. Then your next goal is to go find one yourself. And then your, your next uh, after that is to, share a set of gray fox tracks with another person. So you, you get what I'm saying? You, you, you set these goals for yourself where you're shown a gray squirrel or a red fox or pick the animal. Then you go out and try to find one yourself. And then you're the instructor where you pull somebody else in as no matter how reluctant they are and say, come look, I wanna show you these gray, gray track squirrels that I found. Gray squirrel tracks that I found. I should take the day off when I have to do a presentation in the evening. And then when following a trail, you really should backtrack. And you're not backtracking because you're afraid of getting mauled by that gray squirrel. You're backtracking again out of respect and out of the idea that, especially in the winter, we don't need to be disturbing an animal. So if I'm gonna follow a track for let's say five minutes, what difference does it make to me whether I follow it forward or whether I follow it backwards. I'm still gonna be able to teach my students the same amount of things. I don't know what I'm gonna find in either direction, except if I walk towards the animal, I'm more likely to disturb it. I guess the exception to this, of course, would be there, there might be somebody here that's a hunter. Uh, I, I hunt myself uh, a bit. Um, maybe you are trailing an animal in the hopes of getting a photograph of it or, or taking it as a, as, as a game species, uh, or really just challenging yourself to be quiet enough to trail an animal and be able to, to observe it. Uh, but usually when I'm tracking with my students, none of those are the, are the uh, goals. <clears throat> I'll give you one example of that. I got to watch a pack of wolves in Yellowstone a few years ago, and uh, they, they crossed the road. That's how I was able to see them. And I pulled over and I was watching them for a while and then watched as they continued to the south and went up and over a hill and out of sight and everybody was all excited. I've got some photos of the wolves I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, and so I wanted to look at the wolf tracks. So I went out to the road, turned to the north and walked in the opposite direction of where the wolves were. Not that I was afraid that I was gonna be mauled by a pack of wolves, but I didn't want to disturb them in, in the winter time. Hey, I taught you something when I showed you that elephant uh, footprints. Can you tell which of these wolf tracks is the front and which one is the hind? I'm going to guess that you're all saying it correctly. So this track in the front 
is the hind track. Look how much smaller it is. This is the robust front track of the wolf. I want to point out one other thing. The front track is deeper as well because more weight means a, a bigger, heavier imprint. Okay, in addition uh, to that tracking etiquette that I teach my students, this is, this is how I often try to lead a discussion with them. So if I show them a track, I, instead of telling them what, what the identity is or asking what the identity is, I ask them to tell me what's their three best guesses. And so if you want to take a look at this one, this is a hard one to do it with, but at least I've got a penny there for scale. I will tell you that this is a, a volleyball court at Chapman University in California. If, I don't know that that'll help you at all, but a, a relative of this species is found here in the Finger Lakes. And notice in my second bullet point there, I ask them to give me a top three, even if they're certain of the identification. And a great example of that is here in the Finger Lakes, a deer track. So if we find a deer track, almost everybody can identify it, but I'll say, well, what else could it be? And they'll say, nothing, it's a deer. And I say, but, but what if it was not? What, what would be another thing it could be? And I'll often get answers like pig or goat. Um, which are, are possible, right? Not extremely likely, but at least at least possibilities. If I get answers like coyote and uh, catfish, then I know I'm in trouble. But if I'm getting goat and pig, I'm, I'm pretty happy. And in addition to that top three technique, I try to give open-ended prompts. And I did this once with you guys already. I said, what do you see? So the problem with an open-ended prompt is Sometimes it's so open-ended, you don't even know which, where I'm, I'm headed. But the value of an open-ended prop is sometimes students see things that I didn't see either. And it also gives me an insight into how they're looking and what they're able to see. So don't, don't, uh, don't shy away from these. If you're a beginning tracker, I know a lot of people just want real meat and potatoes. Like, I want to I wanna learn all this stuff. Give me all the facts. Tell me exactly how to do all this. But a lot of times it's more training your eye to see what's there rather than just teach you what the book says you're supposed to be able to find in a track. And then I've got a tell me something. Uh, that's another another open-ended prompt. And sometimes I'll just look at a track and say, hmm, hmm, and just wait for somebody to start talking. Anybody know what this track is? This is the front of a rabbit. <clears throat> All right. The easiest way to start tracking is working with clear tracks. So a clear track is one that shows almost all of the characteristics and you're able to see its size, the shape, the number of toes that it has. So those are, those are our easiest tracks to identify. The ones that we wanna start with are the ones that are the, are the easiest ones. So we need to know a little bit of terminology here. Uh, if you're gonna get a tracking book, it will all uh, show you that they number the toes in a track. So think of your hand right now that's in front of you. Your thumb is a toe one, and your pinky would be a, a toe five. And then that next part here on this lion's foot, this is called the metacarpal pad or the ball of the foot. And then you've got some negative space. I know negative space sounds very hippie-like, but negative space just means it's the area where nothing touched the ground. And then that heel pad, is called the proximal pad. So if you're into medicine, you know about distal and proximal perhaps. So proximal means it's closer to the center of the body. That's why it's called that. And then here are some actual lion tracks uh, that were made by feet like that one that I just showed you. Again, we've got a front and a hind. Look at this front track. Look how much bigger this front track is than this hind. Look at how much uh, deeper it is, how, how more, uh, more unclear it looks. That's because it did more work as it was going. That back foot can look clearer because it was set in and pulled up without doing a whole lot of work like that back foot did. I feel like I need to teach you the three main ways that mammals put their feet on the ground. And if I don't do that, uh, telling you about the tracks themselves really isn't gonna, really isn't gonna do, do as much good as it should here. So let's start with, with one that uh, I, I would really say is my favorite one. There's a way of putting your feet on the ground that's called digitigrade, your, your digits. 
you're walking on your digits, your toes, and the balls of your feet. So again, if you've got a dog or a cat at home, and statistics tell me that about 75% of you guys do, um, you look at them and you look at their track and you, and, or their foot and you realize it's just the ball of their foot and their toes that are touching the ground, not like a human foot that goes all the way to the heel there. And that's an adaptation for running. So animals that are digitigrade are designed to be faster runners. Think about the fastest land mammal in the world is the cheetah. So that, that's a good example of that. Here's a picture that really illustrates that for you. Went to India a few years ago, Laura and I, and uh, went to a national park uh, specifically for tigers. And I got a picture of this tiger walking away from us. You can see the heel way up here. And look at all of that fur on the bottom of the foot. You can tell that this foot is not designed to be used completely on the ground. The heel is supposed to be up in the air and it's only supposed to be walking on the ball of its foot and the toes there. All of our cats do that. I've got a bobcat and lynx here. I showed you a mount lion in the, in the picture before the, the tiger. And in all of these cases, you're looking at an animal that's only walking on its toes and the balls of its feet. The other thing about cats that's kind of interesting, if we look at this bobcat picture here on the left, you're, you, you want to imagine a human hand without the thumb. So if you want to look at your hand right now, I'm doing it myself too. Look at your left hand, tuck your thumb in, and look at how your fingers are arranged, right? You got your pointer finger, then you got that tall one, then you got the ring finger and the pinky. You should be able to see that arrangement here in this bobcat track as well. You've got, you've got toes that are not symmetrical. You've got a leading toe. It's not dramatic in this bobcat, but it's still there. It's a leading toe. And you've got a pinky that drops down lower than that index finger. And that's a great way to be able to tell cat tracks and a great way to be able to tell them from canines. This is a wolf track, a fresh wolf track that we were camping and this wolf, these wolves woke us up at about 11 o'clock at night. They had killed an elk very close to our campsite and we're very excited about it and started howling about it. And so we got up in the morning and, and looked for their tracks and found them. So this guy's only a couple hours old here, but look how symmetrical this is. Again, you can see the four toes. You can see that metacarpal pad or the ball of their foot in the background here. But look how, look how you could just fold this in half like a butterfly. It's bilaterally symmetry uh, that you see in your dog track that you don't find in your cat track. Boy, if you're lucky enough to have a dog and a cat at home, uh, when this is all done, uh, wrangle them up and, have, and compare their feet there. So a lot of people will get me a picture like this of a dog or, or a wolf and they'll say, there's a mountain lion. And I'll say, how do you figure? And they'll say, well, there's no nails. So although it's true that cats usually do not show nails in their prints, a lot of times nails don't show up in dog or canine tracks as well. The truth is there really are nails here. Here's, here's a very easy one to see, um, but they blend in with the toe enough and in this gravelly substrate, they're kind of hard to tease out. The other thing I want to show you, if you haven't seen it already, but once I show it to you, you'll, you'll never unsee it, is this starfish in the middle here. Because we create this uh, symmetrical track, you end up with a, with a five-armed starfish right in the center here. And this negative space, remember that term, in the very center of the track, really stands out and pushes up. It's so dramatic and so easy to see. Here, let's look at the other, uh, another wolf in, in North America. This is a red wolf uh, in North Carolina. North Carolina is the, the, where they've reintroduced the red wolf. And although we were fortunate enough this summer to see one alive, the only photo that I was able to get was of this roadkill. It was a, it's a long story, so I won't tell it tonight, but suffice it to say, we, we met a biologist that was, that was pretty, pretty bummed out about this, this roadkill red wolf. It's an endangered species. Uh, but look at that hole in the center of the track there, that furry spot where the negative space would be, and you can see how deep that is. Now look at an actual track on the other side, and it is not lost on me that I took these tracks, pictures two days before I found the, the roadkill, and I, I really do wonder if I'm looking at the same animal in both in both pictures here. You can see that negative space in the in the wolf track. You can see how symmetrical it is. And once again, you can see the difference between a front and a hind track. My hand is right on the front track and that very uh, shallow 
hind track here hardly shows any nails at all. I can see a nice clear nail here and an unclear nail here, but the two leading uh, nails aren't really visible at all. M making a lot of people think that that might be a cat track, but it, it's clearly a, a, a canine. I wanted to show you that negative space in a different way. So one time I, I found coyote tracks on my property and I got, got down right on my belly and took this picture. So you can see that pyramid right in the middle of the photo there at a great distance. If you know to look for that, you can often see that. And I can identify canine tracks at a, at a pretty good pretty good distance because of because of that. And and here's a coyote also on my property here. We'll just go through that leg one more time. So I'm telling you that this is the animal's ankle here. It's not its knee. This is the knee. Here's the hip. So the hip is way up here where it's supposed to be. The knee bends forward like it's supposed to, and the ankle bends backwards the way it's supposed to. We're just not used to thinking of ankles that far off the ground. I guess I could do the same thing with these red foxes. I know this is a red fox because of how furry the track is. Look at all of the fur, even, even uh, over the toes. So the toes themselves really are clear, but there's so much fur on their underside that when they step, they step into their, into their own fur there. Look at that negative space, uh, making that, that pyramid stand out. And again, the front and the hind, uh, you, should, you should have learned that. Boy, if you're going to learn anything tonight, it's going to be that one. The second way that animals put their feet on the ground is illustrated by this black bear. Now this track isn't super easy to see, which is part of the reason why I used it. But this part is, there's the ball of the foot. Now here's the heel of the foot. Here's the arch, just like in your foot, you have an arch there. And then I've got the toes in the front here. So this is a right rear track, right? Because the arch would be on the inside. So it's going in, in the, in the, if it's moving towards the right, this would be a right foot here. And did you actually know that there were black bears in Texas? They, they figure there's a population of about 20, 25 in the Guadalupe Mountains, uh, right on the border with Mexico. And um, I, when I came here with my daughter in 2014 and she spotted one. So that was pretty cool. We actually got to see one of the very few Texas black bears. And if you didn't notice any nails in that picture, Maybe these two cubs walking across the road in North Carolina can help us tell why. Look at that. I can't find a single claw that's touching the ground. So look how high those nails sit. That's a good adaptation. You don't want your nails to be touching the ground every single time because they wear out too fast. I, I need these for digging, for climbing. So they're set up a little bit higher than maybe you would expect. and all kinds of animals leave tracks without claws because of this arrangement, not just cats. So we call this plantigrade. I tell my students to just think about planting your whole foot on the ground. But the real way to, to know this is the sole of your foot is called the plantar region. Uh, maybe some of you know have heard of plantar warts. Many people call them planters warts, but they're really supposed to be called plantar warts because they show up on the bottom of your foot. So humans, black bears are two good examples of this. And animals that walk on their whole foot are built for walking, like a raccoon. So these were some trail camera pictures from my uh, hedgerow. Have a look at this raccoon at 4.29 AM. And you can see one of his hind feet on the log there. And about 20 minutes later, he's back and he's gotten himself wet in my pond and he's walking away and you can see that foot raised up just like that tiger did. But now you're looking at a heel and, and sole of the foot that is completely unhaired, which means he's supposed to be using it to walk on. And they do, usually. I'm sorry that it's gonna take about two minutes to tell this story, but I'll, I'll try to keep it, keep it brief, but meaningful. I took this picture in Florida, actually with a trail camera. Uh, I uh, gave a presentation at a conference there and brought a camera and literally just set it in the drainage ditch across from my hotel. And I got this cool picture of a raccoon. And at first I thought I caught it just as its hind foot was lifting off the ground and he was moving forward. And it wasn't until I used it a couple times in a PowerPoint with my students that I looked at the other back foot. So have a look at the left foot in this one. Notice 
how little of the foot is wet and how the whole back of the foot is dry. The whole heel to about midway through the sole is all dry. This is a digitigrade animal that's walking in a plantic, oh man, I just said that backwards. This is a plantigrade animal walking in a digitigrade style. This raccoon is wearing high heels. So it's kind of walking on its toes, like Scooby-Doo style, right? Trying to stay sneaky and not, not make a lot of noise, perhaps. Maybe it's just bothered by the substrate. But sometimes you can get animals that are supposed to be plantigrade, they're supposed to put their old foot on the ground, that are just walking on their toes like a digitigrade animal. And it can be confusing. Best summed up by someone that once said to me, I found raccoon tracks, but they all look like fronts. And I'm like, aha, I know exactly what was going on. <clears throat> Here are two different animals with five toes that often get confused in their tracks. Uh, this picture looks a little odd because these tracks are both underwater, but I cannot tell you how excited I was to find this in the real world. Like I didn't set this up. On the right is a raccoon's front track and on the left is an opossum's front track. And those are animals that are often found in the same habitat, and my students often get them uh, mixed up with each other. So if we go back to my top three technique, if I, say, if I show my students a raccoon track and I say, give me your top three answers, two of them are almost always raccoon and possum. So I just, I just love it. The, the possum's got more sausage fingers going, uh, a little bit thicker and notice how they all point straight forward a lot of people say they look like little children's hands i mean these are tiny though you got i mean you're talking infant hands if you let your infant crawl around in the wetland maybe maybe we should be having a different presentation and if you look at the possum track look how sprawled out the tracks are they're a little bit thinner right they they they, they go from thick at the base to thin at the end they're not, they're not really shaped like sausages and they're more in that starburst pattern so those would be the tips that I would give you to try to tell a raccoon from a from an opossum there. South Africa's got some plantigrade animals. Uh, they don't have any black bears there, but they've got baboons. And if you look at the hind track of the baboon next to it here, look how, how all the detail and all these little individual pads and that huge heel print right here. So uh, baboons are plantigrade. And then there's a front there where they, they kind of walk on their knuckles of their of their, their front hand. Okay, there's one last way that animals move around uh, here in North America. So we've, I told you there were three common ways that our mammals get around. And the last one is our, our hoofed animals. And uh, we call that unguligrade. So the ungulates walk unguligrade. And now you're only walking on the tips of your toes. Guys, I've got you to, I've got to have you think about every hoofed animal as walking on its toenails. So if you imagine that hooves really are just the nails of the animal, instead of something really magical and different, they're very similar to the, to the nails that, that you grow. And so I talked about deer and pigs already as examples, and ungulates really are built for running. It doesn't mean they can't walk. Here's a gar right here. I know it's spelled G-A-U-R, but it's pr pronounced gar like the fish. This is the largest bovine on the planet. So this is even larger than the bison uh, that I would see in, in Yellowstone. Uh, and and uh, not by much, but enough, to, enough that they can claim the record there. So this animal is built to run, but it's going to walk unless it needs to run. <clears throat> and their track morphology is different because they've got some different kind of structures here. So each individual hoof is often called a cleave. I've even seen some books that call them cleats. Uh, the subungueus is not something I'm gonna teach you about today, but it's where the hoof meets the pad. And then the pad itself, the, the bottom part, the softer part of the, of the hoof. And then the dew claws, I bet most of you guys knew about dew claws. So often when you see a deer track, this is a moose, which is in the deer family. You've got the two cleaves and then two dew claws behind it there. And then of course, negative space is everywhere where there was, where there was nothing. So that in between the two cleaves, between the cleaves and the, and the dew claws. And do you see how these two dew claws both face sort of uh, perpendicular to the, the track? 
um, that tells me that these are uh, hind tracks. So uh, uh, front track would look, look, uh, Josh, I just said that backwards. These are front, this is a front track. <laughs> ah, that's about the 12th mistake I made tonight. I'm trying to get fired, Allie. They, the, uh, the front tracks line up in this direction. The hind tracks, the dew claws go in basically the same direction as the hooves themselves. I've met an awful lot of deer hunters that tell me they can tell buck tracks from doe tracks. I have not met any tracking instructor or track author that has told me they can tell uh, buck tracks from doe tracks. I think a lot of what, what is out there for deer tracks is misinformation. But one thing that I can tell you here on this, this impressive buck photo here is I use this one because you can see that that hind foot is just about to slip right into the exact spot where the front foot was. So often when you're following deer, it looks like you're following a two-legged animal because its hinds land right in the exact same spot that the fronts do. We call that direct registering. And all of these hoofed animals have slight differences to them, so you really can tell them apart. Part of it is size, so an elk track should look bigger than a white-tailed deer track, but the shape is different. Look how much these look like hamburger buns uh, compared to a deer track. Um, and then uh, I did want to try, I, I, I really would, looked at the clock here and I see that I've already gone on for almost a whole hour. I'm so sorry. I do have a, a bunch more, but if there's anybody here that signed on for this and thought, hey man, an hour is all I'm going to give you on a Wednesday I'm, uh, if, you, if you have to go, um, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just refund you the difference. But have a look here. We're back into South Africa again. I've got a six inch ruler here. And my guess would be that everybody can spot this little track right here. It looks very heart shaped and it is tiny. It is about an inch long here. That's from an animal called the Dick Dick. So the unfortunately named antelope here is very tiny, very petite, full grown. It's the size of a fawn. And I, I, I will go backwards one and say, that track, think about how big an inch is, and that's what you're looking at for a full-grown dick dick track. But that's only part of the story. Did you see the other track? Did you see the track that's about 10 inches long that the dick dick track is inside of? This dick dick stepped into a giraffe track. So Africa's tallest hoofed animal stepped here and one of Africa's smallest hoofed animals stepped on top of it. That's the kind of stuff that just gets me excited. <clears throat> Here it is in graphical form. I wish I could give credit to whoever made this, but I stole this so long ago, I have no idea where it, where it came from. Look at plantigrade, where the heel is on the ground. Then in the middle is digitigrade, like your dog, with the heel up. That's why your dog's leg looks so funny like that. And in unguligrade, you're no longer even on the ball of your feet, you're just on the tips of your toes. I do wanna point out that these are not to scale. We do not have squirrels that are the size of dogs out there. Um, so don't, don't be afraid. A couple other lessons that I'd like to, like to give you before we go is that we have uh, this idea that once you learn a track, you then have to learn it in all the different substrates. So imagine how different uh, a possum track is going to look in the mud versus in the dust versus in the snow versus in the deep snow. And that's what's really exciting about tracking for me is that it's basically now a lifelong pursuit, right? I'm never gonna know everything, and, but I'm good enough now that I, I, I scratch that itch when I'm out tracking where it's not frustrating because I don't know anything at all but I'm always discovering something new, something that makes me pause, something that I learn from or walk away and just have more questions than I have answers. This particular bird is a great egret. And although we have them around here, I took this picture in Australia and I wanted to show you in one day, I found two different sets of great egret tracks. Uh, my brother and his family live in Perth, Australia. I've been down there a couple of times to visit them. And on the left here are some fresh great egret tracks that I watched being made uh, in the sand. 
And on the right here, my sister-in-law is helping me give some scale to these great egret tracks that were made in the wet cement when they poured the sidewalk. And so we're walking along on this footpath and I look down and there are essentially, you know, modern fossilized <laughs> great egret tracks and look how different they look. So they're very, very faint in the cement because maybe it, maybe it hardened up very much and very loose in the, uh, in the sand there. It was just exciting and a, and a great way for me to teach you that, that little concept there. How about these bear tracks on the dumpster at the Mueller Field Station? Um, so you have to imagine that the bear is up on top of the dumpster and reaching down and you can see, uh, reach down with its foot twice here and you can see where it left an imprint from its hairy leg as, as well there on the side. We have a dumpster that locks, uh, but it doesn't mean that they don't try to get through the, through the lid. Uh, usually they're not successful. But my all time favorite substrate is this right here. We were in Rwanda in 2017, and I was walking through the garden in the lodge that we were staying at. And there's a bird that is very much like the hummingbird in North America, and they're called sunbirds. They're a bit bigger and they have a bit of a sickle-like bill, but they do the same thing. They probe into a flower. And one of these sunbirds had landed on this trumpet flower and probed into it for, for food, for nectar, and then flew away and left its three-toed footprints in the, in the place where it was hanging on the flower. Okay, so we've really been talking about tracks, but I have to tell you that how an animal moves is very important in the identification uh, of, of who left the tracks and the interpretation of what the heck was happening there. So I wanna talk to you a little bit with the time that I've got left about gates, uh, G-A-I-T. So the gate or the, or the pattern that the animal moved, we can break them down into two big groups. You got your leg scissoring and you got your body scissoring. So in a leg scissor, like that baboon that's walking on the right there, you can see that its legs are making a scissor motion, right? You've all opened and closed scissors before. That's what their legs are doing. They look like scissors, but the spine is not engaged at all. This would be like you walking down the sidewalk. You are in a leg scissoring uh, posture. And then if you look at that antelope running much faster on, on the left there, you can see that its legs are of course scissoring back and forth, but the, but the whole body is engaged in it, right? The spine is gonna flex and contract, flex and contract. You've all seen an animal, a four-legged animal run before. You, you can probably picture what I'm talking about. And without going into too great a detail with these, uh, the leg scissoring can either be a walk or a trot. And in a walk, you, you always have a body part that's in contact with the ground. At least one foot is in contact. Hey, do you know walking is actually an Olympic event? Like there, there are people that win gold medals in walking and there is a, a, a regulation of how to walk. Like you, you have to always have one foot touching the ground. That's even, that's even a rule in the Olympic sport. If you've never watched it, you need to open a YouTube uh, video of speed walking and, and watch how that works. It's, it's kind of humorous. Trotting is faster and the, the body might even have an airborne phase in a trot. You might have a time when all four of your feet are off the ground but it's only your legs are scissoring. Your body's not, your, your body's not engaged. Your spine is staying, staying level there. I hope, that, I hope that's making sense to you guys. Here's those wolves that I told you I saw uh, years ago in Yellowstone. They're, neither one of them are moving very fast, but have a look at the one on the left. That wolf is in a walk and the wolf on the right is in a trot. So both of them have their spine perfectly level there, but you can probably tell that that one on the right is moving faster. Same day, different species. I watched a coyote go from a walk to a trot, and you can see again that the spine is perfectly level. It's just their legs that are scissoring, a walk versus a trot. If you have a dog, they like trotting. So what would you think this gait is? It, it's, you know, I know it's a stationary picture. It's not a video here. Um, uh, what, what would you think? You got two choices. Does this look more like a, a slower walk 
or like a faster drop. Matt's the only person that I've seen make a make a comment. So, sorry, say it. Somebody said trot. Somebody said trot. Yep. Two trots. You got it. This lioness has the trots. You are correct. So she is about to steal an African porcupine from a couple hyenas that killed it. That's a that's a story in itself. But but good. So a static photo can even show you motion. You can tell by how far out that front leg is stretched. How far that back leg is stretched that this animal is in a trot rather than a rather than just a walk. So animals that are typical walkers are your cats, the hoofed animals, bears, raccoons, possums. Notice that dogs not in here. I told you a dog's typical gait is uh, is the trot, but these guys prefer to walk. If you see a white-tailed deer and it's not walking, there's a reason for that. If you see a black bear and it's not walking, there's a reason for that. And and that's what's kind of fun about the whole tracking piece here. How's everybody doing? You doing okay? I knew this was gonna be long. I cut it down and cut it down, but gosh darn it, I just get so excited about this topic I can't I can't stand and not hear myself talk. These are some possum tracks that I took in Florida a couple of years ago. And uh, have a look at how absolutely gorgeous these are. I was with a group of students. We ran a trip to the uh, Florida Everglades, uh, which makes me think this should be uh, 2020 January instead of 2019. And what we are looking at is the front and hind track of a possum wedged together like that. That's very typical of how they, they their feet end up landing on the ground. I tell my students it looks like two puzzle pieces that don't quite fit together. Like somebody's putting together a jigsaw and they're cheating. And you should be able to tell the front from the hind there. The front is the one that looks like the star that I showed you before when it was compared to the raccoon. And the rear track is the one that looks more like your hand with that thumb sticking out. Do you have me still visible on your screen in the bottom here? So you got the four toes all together and you've got the thumb hanging way out to the side there. And then it should look kind of weird to you because they they match right up. So I've got a left front and a left hind and then above it I've got a left front and a left hind. Well what we're looking at is two possums walking side by side. We're not looking at an animal that has two left feet. We're looking at a, at a, at a at two different guys. And if now you draw your eye to the right you can see what a right hind print looks like. Now that thumb or that opposable big toe, if you want to be technical, uh, is is looking different there. Cool. Can I just run through the body scissors with you guys? I'll, I'll keep them brief. So the two main body scissors are a lope and a gallop. And again, like I did with walk and trot, a lope is slower and, than the gallop. And so they, they, I'll explain this gathered and extended in just a minute, but I wanted to show you, this is a young gar. Remember that big old male that I showed you and I said, that's the biggest bovine on the planet. Well, here's a calf of one and it's, and it's running here. It's actually in a gallop. And that means if it's not walking, there must be a reason for that. This one's actually being chased by a tiger. So this was on that trip to India and we watched a tiger uh, really try to hunt one of these down and the, the big males were just having none of it. They kept interceding and kind of cutting the, li the lion, the tiger off and the tiger would veer around and try to get back at the calf. We watched it for about a half hour till they got so deep into the woods we couldn't see them any longer. And uh, I, I have no idea what ended up happening. But maybe I can show you, show you a different, uh, a, a lope and a gallop here. So here is a loping uh, moose calf. This was up in Alberta, Canada. And this is what I mean by gathered. Uh, when they write this in the tracking books, they're talking about all the legs are gathered together there. And then extended would be when they're when they're reaching out. So you can imagine, you know, maybe you've seen your, your dog dog running there. And all of their feet are off the ground right now, uh, but that's the only time that it happens. So this is a lope. In a faster gallop, like these warthogs here, and when warthogs run, they put that rear antenna straight up in the air you know they're on a mission when that tail is standing straight up like that. So uh, unfortunately, both of these guys in this picture are also uh, uh, gathered instead of extended out in, in front of them. And so that's how, that's how gates work. Those are, those are four gates. I just got one, 
one more to show you. But before I do, I wanted to I wanted to share with you an a, a experience that happened to me one day on the way to work. So these pictures are awful. I they, I took these with my cell phone, and these animals were too far away. But I still think they illustrate what I want to show you here. First, you can see what what drew my eye, of course, was the fact that 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 uh, fawn there, that young of the year deer, is almost completely white. So some people would say, oh, he escaped from the Seneca Army Depot. Well, that's not true. There's there's uh, leucistic or white, uh, pale, very pale deer are born all over the all over the country. Uh, have nothing really to do with the Seneca Army Depot. And and it, you can see that mom, the the adult, the bigger deer, the longer deer here, she's more of a normal color. Well, there's a size difference between the adult deer and the young of the year, the fawn. So so mom is longer. She's got longer legs. And she, if I was going to describe her gait right now, her spine is level, her legs are scissoring, but they seem to be pretty extended. So I'm not going to say walk here. I'm going to say lope. Uh, I'm not going to say lope, am I? That was mistake 862 if you're keeping track. I'm going to say trot. So it went from a walk to a trot. The trot is that faster leg scissoring gait. And I was there, I got to watch this, so I, I could see that she was trotting. Her young is shorter of body and her legs are shorter. She couldn't keep up with mom in a trot because she wasn't fast enough. She wasn't long enough and her legs weren't long enough. So she had to lope behind her mother just to keep pace with her. So here I illustrate two different gates and you can see that this can't be one of the leg scissoring because the whole back is engaged, right? The whole back legs are both off the ground. This is more of an, she's just exiting the extended phase. She's gonna be gathered in just a moment when those back legs get, get up with the front ones there. And as they kept walking away from me, uh, as mom trotted away, uh, the young behind her loping away, you can see that she still had to maintain that faster gait just to keep up with her mother. I think about my dad and I, take my dad uh, out, we go hunting together or or, or or walk into the store together and his legs are just shorter than mine. So I have to modify my gait to keep up with him. That's how it works now. But when 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 the roles were reversed and, and he was the one walking me to the store, I was the little kid, I had to run to catch up to him sort of thing. So it, it, it's just an amazing little snippet where you know, everybody would be excited to see a white deer, but I was extra excited to tease out this little nuance that was involved in, in here as well. If I show it to you in a graphic format, uh, a lope shows two hind feet. Those are in, in, in that yellowish brown color there and two fronts that are in the white. See how they're mixed together? That's because they're, they're, when they gather together, they kind of, they kind of jumble together. But in a gallop, they're all spread out. They're all sprawled out much, much farther apart from each other. So here's a striped skunk tr track that I found in my property. And skunks often lope. So if we go back to this, we expect a lope to be two fronts and two hinds that are mixed up. So you would see a front, a hind, a front, and a hind. And when I look at these skunk tracks, I can see that I have two rights and I've got two two lefts here and look at where the two here's the here's a right and here's a right and here's a left and here's a left and you can see how they're interspersed together here so I've got a, a front and a hind and a front and a hind skunks have amazing long front claws did you know that skunks are excellent diggers and just absolutely amazing tracks that they can leave behind it's like a grizzly bear track that I showed you in the beginning there. Just this tiny little foot with these nails that look ridiculously long. And talking about terrible pictures, this one is not a very good picture either. Uh, but uh, this was a skunk that I saw one day on my drive home from work and he had his foot up and you can see those long claws there. So that's our striped skunk that we've got here in New York State. I can show you one other skunk species. Uh, this was an encounter I had in Chile this is a Humboldt's hognose skunk. And you can see he looks, obviously we can all tell that it's a skunk. But he's a little little cuter than our skunk there with that bulbous Rudolph nose. And I, I was a little distracted. I was thinking about something else and I was walking without paying too much attention. And I got too close to the skunk 
and I didn't even know it was there still it started pounding on the ground. So it's literally stamping its front feet on the ground at me and telling me I'm too close. I didn't just score a touchdown. I know he's wearing referee colors, but that is not the touchdown pose on the right there. It is him raising up and then stamping his ground on the ground and then he'd shuffle backwards and then he'd come at me again and stamp on the ground and shuffle backwards. And I want to point out that I am hours away from getting on an airplane for 17 hours in the air back to back to New York. And I am this close to a skunk and not backing up. I'm just absolutely enthralled by this behavior. It was just absolutely amazing. But check out those big front claws again. Um, skunks are diggers, no matter what species they are. Hey, I got one more body scissor to go with you. You guys, you guys hanging in there? You know, Allie talked for a long time in the beginning in the introduction, so it's not like I've really been talking an hour and 15 minutes. It's been a, it's been less than that. The last body gate that you need to understand here in North America is what's called a bound. So a bound is fast like a gallop is, but this time the rears land next to each other and they land at the same time. So if you look at my muck boot uh, print in the snow there, you can see four prints above it. And like I showed you in that gallop, I know I did it fast. I, I, I really didn't expect this to go this long. I apologize. I don't know why I thought I'd magically be different today. I always talk too long. Um, here's two fronts and then here's two hinds. And you can see that the hinds have landed next to each other. Um, and you can guess that they would have landed at the same, same time there. This is from an Eastern cottontail. And the direction of travel is to the right, which means the fronts land and then the hinds land in front of the fronts. How the heck does that happen? Well, it happens like this. I didn't take this picture live. This is a, a, a really cropped version of a rabbit in my hedgerow here with front of my trail cameras. And you can see the two fronts are on the ground and the two hinds are just about to land in front of them. Look how flexible that rabbit is. Man, I wish I could do half of that. That that would that would be an impressive yoga pose there, the 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 downward cottontail I think is what they call that one, and that's how you end up with fronts behind hinds, that pretzeling action, and that's what I meant earlier when I was telling you that in a walk or a trot the spine is not engaged, but in a gallop or a lope and then the bound is maybe a special kind of a gallop. That, that spine has to be involved in it. It really flexes and extends. So, so I hope that helps make it a little more, a little more uh, understandable for you. These are gray squirrel tracks. Some people look at these tracks and they think they're looking at an animal with four toes. Instead, you're looking at all four feet of a gray squirrel. And I want you to tell me which direction it's traveling. Is it coming towards me or is it going away from me? Is there anybody left? Away. Is Ellie, is Ellie even here? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, away from you. It is going towards me. The two inner tracks are the fronts and the two outer tracks are the hinds because their hind legs are so much bigger. They have to come around the front tracks. The fronts land and then the hinds land in front of them. So that U-shaped track points in the direction that it's going. So it's coming, coming towards me here. But maybe the key is also not a four-toed animal, but a four-footed animal. Here's a chipmunk that's moving very slowly and really illustrates that. There's the two fronts. In, in, the, in the middle, and then here's the two hinds. And in this case, they're only slightly in front of the fronts because this guy was hardly moving at all. You know, sometimes those patterns are so easy to identify that we don't bother to identify the shape of the foot itself. Can you see all four of these rabbit tracks on my dad's driveway in Rochester? Here's the two hind tracks of a rabbit. Here's the two front tracks of the rabbit. And they're just, this is really what, what trackers would call soil transfer. So there was, there was soil or dirt on the bottom of the rabbit's feet. And when it ran across my dad's driveway, it left the soil behind and that's, that's where the footprints are. 
And maybe you can see this one particularly, look how pointy it is. Here's a couple rabbit tracks in the mud. Look at how they're the same shape. So these are, these are a couple, couple rabbit tracks. See how pointy they look? We often don't even bother to look at the toes of rabbits because their track trail is so distinctive. But they're, they're a very J-shaped track uh, right here, this fish hook with the fifth toe being very tiny here. And that was the track that I showed you earlier with the penny next to it uh, on the, on the uh, volleyball court uh, earlier. Maybe my last concept to teach you is this. Once you've learned these track patterns and all this vocabulary, you buy a new field guide and they give you a, a whole different definition. So one of the books that we use with our students is by a guy named Jim Lowry. And uh, he defines a bound very strictly. And he says, in a bound, the rear tracks have to land in the front tracks. And so our rabbit tracks would not be a bound. He just thinks that they're, a, they're, a, they're just a gallop. So uh, we don't have any standard uh, exact set of rules in the tracking community, which keeps things a little bit lively. I was able to photograph a mink in a bound a couple years ago, and maybe you can see that its front feet have just lifted off from where his hind feet are going. And, and here he is all stretched out. This would be extended instead of gathered. And he's just about to launch out and where his fronts land, his rears are gonna come and land right in that spot. And his fronts are gonna take off just before they, they get there. So that's a classic bounding pattern that even Lowry would, would accept. All right, my last question for you, and then I'll see if you guys have any questions for me. So I've been careful to talk about North America throughout this. What would you call this gait right here on this animal? We all recognize the kangaroo, but what do they do? If you said hop or jump, um, that is what every school child would, would ever say. Uh, I have a field guide that calls it a bipedal skip. Um, and if you are a student at ESF, maybe you learned it as uh, a ricochet, ricoch ricocheting locomotion. But have a look at how weird these feet look. So you've got these three toes up front and then this long pad all the way to the heel, which would make you think that this animal puts its entire foot on the ground from its heel all the way to the tips of its toes. And this doesn't help because it's, it's in midair here, but at least we can see the bone structure. So the foot goes from the tip of that long, vicious looking nail there to the heel, and then up, up it goes. That's the, that's the Achilles tendon there. But here's our clue of how they actually use those feet, um, that, that, that they really are more digitigrade than they are plantigrade because they wanna move fast. When they're just standing on all of their weight, they will have their heel on the ground, but in that bipedal skip or that ricochet locomotion, they are really plantigrade animals. And I do want to say that that person is a little bit too close to that kangaroo. Both the backs and the fronts have some pretty big claws, and they are sometimes a little scary looking. So the male kangaroos, can they, they're pretty jacked up. I, I thought I was going to get mugged out here, to be honest with you. I had left... The, the, the New York New York City uh, by, by airplane and made it to Perth and uh, we're out on the hiking trail and I'm just about to get jacked up by this big male kangaroo here, I thought. They, they just are so muscular looking. It's a, little, it's a little weird looking. And I don't know if you guys are into memes or not, but there was a, a meme going around a few years ago that was the, the me and the, the guy she told me not to worry about meme and I thought that was that does look like me on the left there that's that's pretty much my my deal laying down with a big belly instead of that that ripped look on the on the right so uh thank you for hanging in there I really appreciate it uh I want to remind you that uh not all these presentations are this long so don't be frightened for next month um I really feel like that what I what I'm hoping is that maybe this is just the beginning for you to get excited about about looking at tracks or sign a little bit more more detail for you and it's you know it has to be done outside right you can do your book work inside and learn about them but to actually see these things you got to get out and do it and that's what's exciting for me 
is when I'm out and I'm, I'm always looking for animals or signs of animals, and then maybe remember to take a scenic picture now, now and again. Uh, appreciate all of that. I'm, I'm here to answer questions too. If, if people want to uh, segue into that, I will give you all of my free knowledge, which is worth every penny. So happy to answer any questions that you guys have for me. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. That was really, really great. I burst out laughing several times. So thanks. <laughs> that was my goal, Molly. <laughs> Let's see. Enjoyed the presentation. Um how to estimate populations on a deer trail question mark. Yeah, that would be a tough one. So if you're looking at a deer trail and you're you're trying to figure out, uh, do I have a lot of deer, and that's why I have a lot of tracks, or do I have one deer that's making a lot of trips? So one of the things I didn't talk about at all in here that I'm really not particularly good at, which is why I didn't talk about it, is how to age tracks. So one thing perhaps that you could do would be uh, like like first you have to encounter the track to trail, right, and then maybe kind of smooth it out and, and erase erase everything. And then maybe may be able to make more of an estimate uh, based on how how quickly it fills back up with tracks again. But that would be that would be an interesting one. Uh, essentially, I guess your your best bet there is to try to be looking at how how fresh or old the tracks are. And then it's to some level you can tell individuals apart. I one of the tests that I took, we were given a, a whole pile of deer tracks, and the question was how many deer were here. So it was five deer that were all traveling together at the same time, and it took us about a half hour to puzzle that all out. So I, I guess if you had enough time and had enough knowledge, you could you could get more sophisticated with that. But I, I do like the idea of maybe smoothing it out and and seeing how quick it takes to to fill it back in again. If if I'm reading your question correctly. Thank you. Got some more thank yous. Thank you. I have a question, but it's just about that skunk. Um, what's what was the type of skunk that was? It was called the Humboldt Pogno skunk, and I'm not sure who Humboldt was, but they named a penguin after him as well. So. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. They're they're cute. Wow. Well, the native skunks to this area will they do something similar? Yes, that's a really good question, Ellie. So I do. I have experienced that only one time. We used to have a bird feeder in the backyard and I taught a night class. And I remember coming home one night and uh, you know, you gotta you gotta drive I gotta drive about 40 minutes to the college and so I was all full of Dr. Pepper when I got home and to stay awake and just decided I better go kill the bird feeder for tomorrow morning and I'm out there filling the bird feeder and suddenly I hear a noise literally at my feet. And there was a skunk that was feeding on the bird seed that had fallen out of the out of the bird feeder and was stamping the ground to warn me to back away rather than spray me. I don't know how I've never been sprayed, but it's it's because of their will, not because of my intelligence. So I, I've had it personally happen to me once. There's a spotted skunk that's a little bit south of here. And instead of stamping, they'll do a handstand and uh, threaten, threaten to splay that. That's a cool thing to, to look at. I've never seen it in, in real life, but you can Google that one. Yeah, I will. So cool. More thank yous. There's still some people hanging out. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them. Also, this presentation was recorded, so we'll put it on our YouTube channel for you to go back to if you want. Excellent. Probably everybody's just hanging out because they want to ask you, how do I make sure I get extra credit from Bateman for being here? So, do you want to answer that for him? Well, well, we know who registered, I guess, is how that works. Yeah, we do. I have all the attendees, so you're all set. You're all set for that extra credit. All right, John, I think that's it. Very good. That was that was awesome. Thank you. Yep. If anybody thinks of any other questions, you can always send them through Facebook, and Allie or I will get them and answer them for you. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Enjoy your night. Stay dry. <laughs>